What's up, gangsters? I have been suffering from a bad case of the Christmas time crud, and I feel like ass. So, yeah, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time with preamble. Let's just get right to it. This video will go from <laughs> wherever the last one left off, I honestly can't remember, all the way to just about done uh, with uh, all the weathering and the things. And then the next video is going to be just basically the, here's the finished thing, because it is sitting right here, and it is finished. So, anyway, yeah, so much for the not much preamble. Okay, so here we are about a week after the last uh, episode, and I finally decided to sit down over the weekend and work on the tracks. And as you can see... That one is sort of on there. I say sort of, you can't really tell, but it's not glued on. It's just sitting on there, and the other one is still right there. And so now I'm going to tell you how I got to where I'm at. Um, and that is also a story of things not going like I saw it in my head. <laughs> yeah, because this was kind of a fail, but... To set that up, I need to give you some details for the background. I told you that my plan was to basically try and copy uh, what uh, Spud Jonathan Murphy had done on his Sherman. And so that included doing my tracks the same way that he does. So, let me find some pictures here, pictures that I can show you on my phone without getting into trouble. All right, so let's take a look here. This is from Mr. Murphy's pay Facebook page where he goes through his method, and I love the way these look. I don't know if it's realistic. I mean, it looks authentic. It looks, certainly looks plausible. Uh, and to be clear, this is stage three of four. The last stage is where he goes and dry brushes to highlight all of the, you know, polished metallic parts like the cleats on the tread. At any rate, so I, I wanted to do what he did. And what the way he did it is he uses these paints. These are life color paints. And he adds a little bit of flow improver and uh, makes basically a wash and says that he gets here within just a couple of layers. And he does it by speckling by hand, where he uses a brush and something to flick it against. So I thought, well, I can do that, and I've got the perfect stuff for that. I am going to use my, uh, my inks, my Liquitex acrylic inks that I love so much, and that I've used for weathering in the past. Um, had good success with them. They're super pigment rich. They're already pretty thin. And I thought, yeah, these will be perfect. And on top of that, I'm going to make the process even more efficient. Okay, there's some of the aforementioned inks. Basically what I did is I mixed up matches or you know as close as I could eyeball to the colors that Spud had on his uh, in his step-by-step uh, -step. and that went you know that was all fine um, I mixed basically the way that I've mixed washes with these inks before um, and you can kind of see this is one of the lighter tones um, and so it was basically um, a couple of droppers full of ink and a couple of drops of this stuff. This is just your regular old Liquitex Flow Aid. And then I uh, added enough water to bring it up to about the 10 millimeter line on this little cup. Because again, I've done that in making washes in the past. Sometimes I will use. Um, X20A because that works really good as a thinner and I probably should have in this case but honestly I sort of forgot anyway so I thought okay I'm good to go and I thought as a further uh, step or a further innovation <laughs> if you will if I 
may be so bold uh, as to use that term. And I thought, well, I can do the traditional hand speckling method, but why would I do that when I've got this right here, this being my Iwata HPTH with a 0.5 millimeter needle, which is basically a paint cannon, and it's got this wonderful Mac valve on the hose. It's got this one here as well, but this one here on the hose is a Grex thing, and it's super easy to fiddle with this large knob. And I know that there's a sweet spot where I can close it all the way down and then open it back up just a little bit. And then there's a range, and it, it kind of depends on the material, but we're talking a range of about, I don't know, maybe one eighth of a turn, where you can go from spraying small fine droplets to basically just pissing a stream of paint out of the nozzle. And I love that for speckling effects. And I thought, well, if I'm gonna be using five different tones and, you know, with my stupid lobster hands, the traditional thing where you hold the, the, the thing you're gonna flick against in the brush and try to get it to hit the right spot is kind of uncontrollable. I thought, yeah, I'm just gonna use, I'm gonna use the paint cannon. Yeah, well, <laughs> that all seemed like a really, really good plan. But we all know that uh, the best laid plan never survives contact with the enemy. And that was kind of the case here. I say kind of because it's not that it didn't work. It's just that it didn't work very fast. <laughs> and I found this out very quickly. You know, Spud said it took him about two layers to get to something, you know, like what he wanted. Well, it took me about 200 layers to get to this because my washes were just too thin and they would look really, really great when I put them on. And then by the time they dried, they were so transparent as to not even be there. And like I was got to the point where I was even using a hair dryer to dry them real quick so that I could see. And I was just flicking layer after layer after layer and it just really got to be tiresome. And I also started uh, using uh, the same technique to begin to build a base of dirt tones on the underside here of the, of the hull. And that also was not going super well. And you can see where I'm at with it. And <laughs> yeah, so again, I don't hate it, but I just really wasn't getting where I thought I was supposed to be. And Spud was confirming that because he's been kind enough to uh, give me some instruction in real time. And so what I did was over the course of the weekend, I just gradually let this solution evaporate its liquid carrier and get to where it was about as thick as it was when it came out of the ink bottle and just kept trying it out to see if it would work better. And so I got eventually to this. I also realized that my tone was just too dark and I wasn't getting any differentiation between the cleats and the dirty part. Um, and so I just messed with the tone until I got it to where I, where I you know, got something that at least looked like a decent base that I could live with. And so that's what I've got here and I'm reasonably happy with it. Now, one of the reasons that I'm reasonably happy with it, and this is also part of the reason that this is sort of a fail, is because one thing I realized pretty quickly is um, that I was kind of starting from a position of weakness because the tone that Spud used for his bass metal was quite a bit darker than mine. This is MRP dark aluminum plus a little bit of black to get it to what I felt was kind of a raw steel color. 
and it really just needed to be darker. It would have just been a lot easier if things had been a little bit darker because what I want is to get differentiation between the dirt and the steel. But, you know, it is what it is. Now, what I did, one of the reasons that I chose the ink was because I knew that once I had it on here, that it would be pretty easy to come back with a Q-tip loaded up with 409 because as I've learned, 409 will easily remove this Liquitex acrylic ink. And so I just able to wipe it right off of the high spots and get those cleats showing through and get what I think is, you know, not a bad look. I think it looks authentic. It's just a little more subtle than what I wanted, especially at this scale. Now, talking about scale, that's the other thing I learned pretty quickly is that, <laughs> yeah, everything that's, that Spud is showing me, he's been doing at 1 16th scale. So literally three times as wide as these tracks. And yeah, that's got to be a lot easier because when I was trying to speckle these, even with my airbrush method, I basically was just covering the whole damn thing almost instantly. And it took me quite a while to sort of figure out a pattern that would kind of work. And the idea is to get, you know, random color variations in all of these little segments. And I was kind of losing it, and so I just finally punted and just got a brush and started just slobbering it on here uh, until I got something that I felt okay about, and that's what's there now. So, it's, you know, it's okay. Um, it's a base. I mean, the tracks, I think, are, are probably, you know, they're probably about where they're going to be. I don't know that there's much more to be gained with them, um, but I am going to... Uh, lock all of that in with some MRP super clear matte and then you know maybe tinker with them a little bit more um, see what I can do anyway as I said I was also doing the same thing here and this is about three four layers and I and I was gradually letting the material thicken up I also was applying it by by with a you know by hand um, in areas like the back of the of the bogies where a lot of mud I felt like would get flung upward onto that mechanism by the the you know forward rotation of the wheels I, I don't know just to show a little differentiation I was doing that by hand and again this part is just to build a base because the next step in the spud method is to after I lock all this in with some dull coat uh, MRP super clear mat is to come along and um, use uh, pigments, pigment fixer. He's using like the enamel mud products from uh, AK or, or ammo, whichever it is. Anyway, I, I'm going to use pigments and I'm going to build all that up under here. Again, I'm not trying to make this thing look totally muddy. What I'm trying to make it look like is that it was muddy and that it's largely dried out and you still have a lot of that residue but not so much caked on mud that you lose all of this structural detail and it becomes really about the mud rather than about the, you know, about the, about the thing. So anyway, that's what I'm going to do next. Um, one thing I also did was uh, I added some sort of rust seepage uh, around these welds. I also used some uh, Liquitex transparent burnt uh, sienna to highlight those welds with a little bit of, of rust and uh, you know really again try to sell the idea that that's metal and not wood and I also did that here on these uh, places where it's flame cut that's the kind of thing that absolutely happens to a fresh flame cut literally overnight you'll get that kind of fresh rust and that translucent uh, Liquitex burnt sienna on top of silver really makes about as convincing a, a fresh rust spot as I think I am, you know am capable of making so there's that anyway so you know that's I just wanted to put the track on there to just kind of have a look at it see what I thought you know before I committed to it and again, uh, it's been nice with the uh, with this ink because, like I'll show you, I've got a little spot of uh, of the ink on the bottom of this wheel right here, and I really don't want the rubber part of the wheel. You can see right there by my thumb. I really don't want that to 
uh, to, to, to the, the, the tread, can't even talk. I don't want the tread to have the same level of dirt on it. So with that 409, just reach in there, wash that right off. No big deal. Super easy. Comes right off. So anyway, I, again, I don't hate it. I don't think it's really a fail. It just, again, didn't go exactly like I thought it was going to. Um, but, you know, it's not at the point where I feel like, oh, I need to take all this off and go back to square one. I'm going to press forward. Okay, so here we go. I think I mentioned in the last segment that the next thing I was going to do was uh, put a clear coat on all of this uh, ink that I had put down. And as usual, that was my quick and easy MRP uh, super clear matte. And this stuff is just fantastic because pretty, I mean, you can use it right out of the bottle, but what I do, because in this situation, all I'm really trying to accomplish is basically just burn the pigments into the lacquer that's already there. And so I'll take this and I'll thin it like two to one with just cheap hardware store lacquer thinner and blow some on there. And it's, uh, it's enough to, to give me a flat surface, but not enough to you know, add any, uh, any significant thickness. So you can see now that my base layer of dust with the Liquitex ink is pretty well in place. And like I said in the last clip, this was a sort of, uh, yeah, long and silly journey to just get something done that should have taken about five fucking minutes. But I had never used the Liquitex inks for this particular application and so yeah we live and learn but i think i have a decent base for the next thing which is going to be uh, some enamel uh, weathering products or oils or maybe a mixture of oils and pigments i don't know but it's going to be something to do with mineral spirits anyway and then the tracks this this rolling disaster but they are better um, because, uh, again, I think I mentioned in the last segment that I had screwed myself by starting with too light of a metallic tone. And so what I did was, I, since I had uh, uh, said MRP Super Clear Matte on these, and I knew that it would soak up some... Uh, Tamiya panel line wash. I just started slobbering some black and brown TPLW on the areas that were still kind of too bright and it darkened them up. And so not great, but better. And the truth is that when I do the aforementioned uh, dirt using pigments and whatever, that that's probably all going to get covered up. So yeah, I, you know, I hate to be the hide it with weathering guy, but <laughs> this is going to be one of those times where I hide it with weathering. Um, yeah. So what in the actual ass is going on here? Okay. So I can explain. What, what happened? Oh, what had happened was, uh, okay, so here's the deal. Yeah, let me get the camera in a better orientation here, and I will explain what has happened to the tiny Sherman. You guys know that I made the decision to put the tracks on separately get all the running gear glued on firmly uh, wrap the tracks around them while the glue was still soft let it take shape then remove them and paint them separately etc etc and this is all as i've discovered part of a process of being entirely way too obsessed with these fucking tracks because you can barely see the damn things when it's done. But nonetheless, I had to go through this as part of my beginner at armor modeling journey, I suppose. Anyway, 
if you recall, they join over here. How do I know that I even had them on there correctly? Well, because Tamiya, in their usual Tamiya fashion, does a pretty good job of trying at least to engineer this so that you can't fuck it up and it can only go on one way. There's a pin on this set of rollers that mates with a, with a, with a hole in the bottom of the track right there. And the only way that works is if you've got everything facing the correct direction. So, yeah, it's a pretty good theory, but I, I observed a couple of issues. The first one was that it did not want to go onto the drive sprocket very well. The pitch of the teeth just didn't match the pitch of the little holes in the tracks because... You know, when you glue this thing together, your tendency is to, to push it all the way together at each joint because there's like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pieces there. And you'd like to believe that that actually will work, but not so much. It's a tolerance game. And I don't know that it could ever really come out perfectly unless the tolerances were just super, super loose. I was off by basically half a tooth pitch. And the only way to solve it was to uh, basically put glue back in these joints, let it soften up again, and then just mash it on there. I also trimmed a little bit off the tip of each tooth because the holes were a little small. That helped a little bit. Anyway, it was a little bit of a hassle. But that was just the beginning. What I did then was, and that was before all this, uh, you know, <laughs> rigging happened. What I did then was glue it down here at the bottom all the way back to this one and glue it at the top so that then I could focus just on joining it back here. And I'll show you kind of what that looked like with the track on the other side that I haven't done yet. But first, let me get all of this mess out of the way. This has just been, yeah, this kit has been pretty drama free, but this, this had the potential to turn it into a dumpster fire. Fortunately, I've at least gotten away without really fucking anything up. However, as you can see, it looks like dog shit. And I don't know, I, I, I worked with it as much as I felt like. And I don't know that I could do any better. You can see, yeah, that just looks terrible. And I don't know that any amount of dicking around with it is, is gonna help. I, I may try, I don't know. This is one of those times where you start to think, yeah, that old uh, trope about just putting mud on it to hide the problems might be the only solution. That and just don't ever look at or take a picture of that side. It's horrible. I'm ashamed. Ah, so, but let's look and see what I had to start with. Okay, so, flipping it back over. Uh, you can see that's the gap that you gotta close. And it didn't start out looking real good to begin with. So, I don't know. This may be, yeah, I don't know. I may be about to just get into Fusion 360 and engineer some sort of special clamp that would work on, you know, like both sides of this. Uh, grab the wheel, push on this. I don't know. We're, we're, we're finna find out. Because I'm not going to do what I did on the other side. That just looks terrible and that's not acceptable. So anyway, let's talk about the happy stuff. The parts that I do love. So what got me to this point was, as you can see, I continued with the adding of the filthiness and the dirt to the tracks. And... That's what all of this mess over here is about. So what I did, again, kind of working off of Spud Murphy's recommendation is I used a combination of white burnt umber and raw umber oils and a bunch of 
pigments. Uh, let's see, I used these three. Uh, they were all about the right tone. Light dust and airfield dust and this one is Europe Earth. Airfield dust just always ends up being my favorite one. Um, and but having you know mixtures is is a good thing because what you really want is some variety. And I just kept using you know mixtures of the oils. Like I would take the oils, I'd, I'd take my my crappy brush, and I'd stick it in the oil paint, and then I'd stick it in the pigment and get a like, kind of a little paste going. And I'd put that where I wanted to have some actual mud. Because my intent here was not for it to be like super muddy. But again, a little muddy, you know, rained on, gone through puddles, still has some residue of the mud, but not just like caked up. But still, you know, kind of on everything. Um, and then I would, you know, use some mineral spirits to thin it out in certain places. Uh, using pigment fixer um, in certain places. And also using this stuff. This was a real pleasure. This, okay, so some of you know that a few years ago, unfortunately, we lost Adam Wilder in the weathering products market space. It was a whole thing with the guys that were making this stuff for him in Russia and bad business deals and all that. And he quit and there was a sale. And I bought some of his products. I didn't really need a whole lot, but I thought, you know, maybe someday and I'd like to try this out. That's been like two years. And I was hoping that I would open this and like a bottle of fine wine, that it would still be wonderful. And it was a close call. I'm not going to lie. It was all coagulated at the bottom like enamel products tend to do. But unlike my experiences with ammo and AK enamel weathering products that will go off and completely rubberize at the bottom of the bottle to the point where you don't you absolutely cannot stir it up no amount of adding thinner or shaking or steel balls or anything will revive it because basically the resin has actually cured in the bottle. And I've seen this happen multiple times with AK and ammo enamel products before the motherfuckers are even opened. And people, you know, you post it online and be like, oh, you just need to shake it. Listen, dumbass. No amount of shaking will, will solve the problem if the resin is completely cured. Well, this was close, but I was actually able to stir it up and it makes this lovely sort of melted ice cream thickness liquid that is the perfect color tone and it works great. You can use it. You can get mineral spirits to make it thinner. You can do the same trick of glooping it on with pigments and it's just fun to use and it's great and it sucks that you know, it's gone because it's the only one that I've found that didn't have these, you know, these problems. So anyway, that's how I got here. And I'm actually pretty stoked about it. I feel like this is nicely authentic. It's got a little bit of crusty texture in certain areas, you know, some variety. Um, and I, I'm, I'm pleased with that. So that's what got me here. And now I've got to decide what to do about this because, again, I ain't gonna. I, I feel like, especially, I really like the way that wheel looks, and I'm not gonna screw that up the way I did the other side. So we'll see. I'll come up with a solution and report back. I almost forgot. I also did some work on the top side because one thing that I wanted to do was show the effect of dust that has collected. Um, and, you know, gotten wet and, you know, concentrated in areas uh, like, you know, corners and creases and things like that. Um, this is a real thing. In fact, I had, you know, my tractor with the uh, shredder on the back of it sitting right outside the studio for the last six months. 
as a perfect example of this type of effect, and I kind of love it. So I did that, and uh, the next thing I'm going to do after I get this track issue squared away is I'm going to put a light layer of dust over pretty much the whole thing using a mix of ink and isopropyl alcohol, not isopropyl alcohol, I could, but I'll probably use X20A because it's better with the uh, Liquitex white. Anyway, I'm going to spray a light layer of dust on almost the whole thing and then come back with a sponge and some uh, more X20A or IPA or maybe just some 409 and dapple it so that it doesn't, so that it's clearly been like, it's dust that's been, you know, that coating of, of dust and oxide and gunk that collects on your paint over time, but that gets rubbed away wherever people are doing people things. So like around handles and around the engine, you know, covers and all that stuff. So anyway, that, that's gonna be next, but I gotta solve this track problem first. Okay, so it's a couple of days and a little bit of engineering later, and, uh, yep, I have produced a thing. This little gizmo right here. And hopefully it's immediately obvious how I'm going to use this as compared to the <laughs> contraption of uh, several days ago. This is going to go around the wheel and allow me to put clamping force just on the wheel and the track and hopefully shove all of this into a better looking situation. And I've had this thing primed with extra thin for the last five or 10 minutes. So hopefully it's softened up and ready to go and this is gonna work. I mean, I, I don't know, doing this live and on camera is, yeah, makes me nervous. But hey, that's what happens on the Rube Goldberg channel. So we'll just see how it goes. And with, you know, once I get this thing on there, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, but let's just see, live action how this is going to go. Uh, hopefully, did, there we go. I did a good enough job of engineering, yep, to at least get it on there. Let's just see. The whole idea was to get even clamping force all the way around the track because that's what I was trying to do with all of the toothpicks and the other rigmarole so let's see what happens I this is starting to give me some resistance as I turn it and I'm kind of looking in there and I don't know it seems like things might be moving. Hopefully we won't hear any horrible noises. You know, that's always the sign that something <laughs> something has gone uh, awry. Um, it does look like the gap is, is closing up, at least on part of it, not so much right there. So yeah, you know, hey, look, I'm just gonna keep cranking. I don't feel like I've really got much to lose. I mean, yeah, I do. I could just completely fuck everything up. But what's the worst that can happen? I can completely destroy the track and the wheel and have to chop it off and go buy another kit and completely remanufacture that section. I, I could that that could be the like ultimate worst case. So that's kind of how I, you know, kind of how I get myself through these situations. I imagine, okay, what's the worst possible scenario? And if that came to pass, what would I do? So 
so anyway yep just continuing to yeah and I can see that it is not gonna go because they're not at quite the same spot laterally to where the little hinge between the two parts of the tracks that are supposed to join up can meet so I'm gonna have to fiddle with that so I'm gonna do that and then I'll be back okay so it's sort of working I had to make an adjustment I took a little bit of material off of the top edge of the pusher there because it was just pushing up against the bottom of the fender so I fixed that and you can see that if you look in there it is conforming around the wheel but still not meeting all the way and part of the reason is because you can see right there is that it's coming loose here I put a little glue here to give it some slack and it's coming loose right there and uh, it, it looks like it's conforming pretty well inside here so I think the thing to do because it seems like I, that just continuing to tighten this thing it's about at its limit right now is not going to to help me with any of those things and in fact is probably what's causing it to do this right here and I don't want to risk stripping out my thumb screw threads so I'm gonna just leave this to sit for a while and then I'm gonna take this off and see where things are uh, in an hour or two so all right, so it's been a few hours. I have no idea what this is going to look like, but yeah, I'm going to go ahead and take the uh, take this little clamp off and see. Let's just see what's up. What I hope is that things have conformed and set into a better better condition we'll see I am happy with the way the little clamp is functioning okay so let's see I mean that is more circular for sure I think it's overall a little bit better but it's still not connected but yeah, I don't know. So now I'm going to have to fiddle with it and see if I can get the rest of that taken care of. Okay, so I'm feeling a little better about things. Uh, you know, we'll see. What I did was I softened this up with some more extra thin. And then I mushed this part of the track right here against the bottom of that uh, wheel. Just clamped it with tweezers and wixed, uh, wixed, wixed, wicked, wicked some extra thin CA in there to hopefully lock the track to that part of the wheel. Then I put, because I was still not close enough right here. So then, you can't probably see it, but I arranged a toothpick inside of there it's underneath this part of the clamp to put pressure only on a particular part of the track and that shoved it a little further forward and then I've got this additional toothpick uh, to push the uh, end of the track down and there's there's extra thin under all that so hopefully it's soft and uh, it's gonna gonna take a set and I'm gonna let it do exactly that just chill for a while okay so here we go this is how it stands I ended up uh, shoving a toothpick in right there to help push that last link down at least against the wheel but as you can see there's still a little bit of a gap and that's yeah that sucks um, it's also not really well aligned there at the back but overall it looks better than the other side and so what I'm going to do is put a little super glue in that gap to help make it look a little less offensive and then hopefully a little creative use of some mud and 
At least maybe it won't stick out too much like a sore thumb. Anyway, I'm just over it and it's time to move on. Okay, so uh, you guys were probably way ahead of me, but I forgot to mention that, <laughs> yeah, I had said if I was going to do this again, which I definitely never will because I'm never building another 148th tank, and that means at larger scale that I should not have to put up with these weird link and length tracks because you have a lot more uh, aftermarket options available. Anyway, um, I had said that I would just leave the joint down here instead of up here, but obviously, given that the strategy is to use the rolling drive sprocket to feed the track in across the top, <laughs> that wouldn't work very well. So what I think I would have to do is leave a joint here and down here so that you basically had two pieces to add back on after paint. I don't know, but that just instinctively seems like that could work. Well, I just thought I was done and ready to move on, but there were a couple of areas that I was not super happy with, and I thought, you know, in typical Rube Goldberg fashion, that I would see if I could improve the situation. So I went around in a couple of places and used the clamp, but with a toothpick underneath it to put the pressure on a specific spot rather than just around kind of the whole circumference of the of the wheel. So let's take this off and see if this particular one got any better. Let's see, I used the, nope, it didn't. That sucks. I was trying to push that one in and I thought that I had the toothpick in the right place. I stuck it there with the uh, little bit of blue tack and uh, so it stay put, but clearly it did not really help. Kind of surprised because it definitely worked on the other side. Um, in fact, the other side actually looks pretty good, or at least it did last night. Yeah, this is not too bad. That's definitely better than it was. So that part I can move on from. The other side, I don't know. Maybe I'll keep tinkering with it or maybe I'll just call it a day. So of course I couldn't resist trying another thing with the clamp just like that. So let's see how that looks. We take it off. I ran some extra thin in there and I got a little bit under the tape, but hopefully that did not destroy anything too badly. So that helped the one that I was chasing, which was this pooching out. Now this one right here is still poochy. I feel like maybe I'm starting to play whack-a-mole a little bit and that <laughs> this may be chasing, chasing rainbows, but yeah, why not? I'll just, you know, I am really not in a hurry. I'd like to finish this stupid thing before January, but that's arbitrary. Anyway, one thing that this has sort of made me realize, kind of opened my mind to, is there's been a, a bunch of times where I was looking for a clamping solution and I thought, you know, a little C-clamp would be a great thing to have, but I didn't have one and I didn't have sufficient motivation to make one. But this makes me realize that different permutations of this thing could be pretty useful. One thing that I did figure out was that because I made the uh, pusher the way that I did to put more pressure on the top. And I was working off of a photograph of this side that it did not work on the other side. So since I had a spare, I just took and chopped one, chopped it off so that it would work on either side. Anyway, we'll see what happens uh, with this last little bit. Okay, I got slowed down a bit uh, because of having the crud and lots of sniffles, but 
I did uh, tinker with the tracks a little more, of course, and I got them looking better there at the back on both sides. But yeah, I did add some extra mud right here, uh, but it's not too bad. Um, anyway, uh, I'm almost done. I've started adding the stowage and I'm down to the last few steps. And so we will not see this again until the next video and I'll just show you the whole finished thing. Okay, so there you go. As always, I hope this was at least somewhat interesting and informative and maybe even useful. Um, at any rate, I appreciate you watching. Much love.